Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have yet another awesome guest. When are our guests not awesome on Mormonish? We have the amazing Dave Free. How are you tonight, Dave? Hey, doing great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is going to be another really interesting episode. I say that every time, but I mean that every time. And I feel like you guys think so too. So I don't know if you all remember on the Mormon newscast, probably would have been a month or so ago at this point, we covered a story and I think it was RFM that was talking about it, a new movie that's coming out with Hugh Grant, who usually plays a good guy, right? He's the nice guy. He's the friendly guy. But in this movie, it looks like he's, I don't know, a terrible serial killer, crazy person. <laughs> but the movie is about two sister missionaries who are knocking doors, end of the day, in the rain. And this gentleman played by Hugh Grant lets them in. And then it kind of goes from bad to worse as he, you know, I, I get the sense it might be more of a psychological thriller. Is that what you thought, Dave? Something more, not a totally. slasher movie, but. Yeah, totally. It'll be interesting. But... Yeah. Yeah, because he kind of challenges their faith, belief, and disbelief. And and again, this is just right. a trailer. This is actually going to be in theaters in September, and I'm sure we'll all be posting about it. But the reason that I bring this up is because, you know, it's about missionaries on the big screen, and it's about perhaps the darker side of being a missionary, which lots of us don't hear. We go to all those homecoming talks, and people might tell an amusing anecdote, a dog chased me or something. But a lot of the stories that stay with the missionaries, I feel like, are not told readily they may come out later so interestingly enough um in my email after that episode this awesome email from dave and he has this story about his mission that you know as landon and i called him and talked to him we just thought this is a really important story and it's kind of it's kind of a story that represents i think what mm -hmm. the experience might have been for a lot of different missionaries and like i said again untold i mean you were a missionary landon what what do you think well, I went to Indiana, so the whole thing was a horror story. Um, oh, but, uh, Landon. He can't get <laughs> nothing, over Indiana. Nothing as bad as, as what Dave experienced, that's for exactly. sure. Uh, you so... know, you just keep disparaging Indiana over and over. <laughs> I mean, what is up with disparaging Indiana like that? Come on, Landon. And to our viewers and listeners in Indiana, we love you despite what Landon is saying, right? <laughs> we do. <laughs> I, I have no problem with Indiana. I just have a problem going on a mission to Indiana. <laughs> okay, let's make that perfectly clear. We need to go visit Indiana. Mormonish does Indiana. I think, you know what? That would be, wouldn't that be an interesting episode to go back to your mission field that and to like be. go around to, Landon's already getting triggered. Like, yeah. <laughs> you think we're good TV viewing, okay? That's what <laughs> There'd be nobody to talk to, though, because nobody nobody ever took the discussions. <laughs> Here he goes again. Here he goes again. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, either way, we've all had horror stories, right? So, I think so. Right. We, yeah, all we all have That's our right. own horrors, but uh, Dave's I, is unique. <laughs> yes. is, and I put tons of boys into the MTC, all my boyfriends, and each one of those was kind of a horror story in its own, but that's a whole different episode. So <laughs> anyway, let's let Dave, enough delightful banter, introduce yourself really quick, and then we'll kind of dive into this topic of yeah. missions and missionaries. You know, the last thing, you know, watching a Mormon newscast, the last thing I expected would be to be like messaging you right <laughs> after. But I, as I was listening to that, I thought, you know, it might be a good thing to uh, share my experience. I, ha I have a couple experiences that I think could relate to to uh, people that have served missions and, and maybe even just people that have, you know, struggled with some anxiety or PTSD after traumatic events. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I um, I live in Sandy. I, I'm 40, been married for uh, 19 years, came home, met, met my wife, and we got married after six months. You probably never heard that, right? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, we have two kids, uh, 16 and, and uh, 14. And uh, it's kind of funny because as I started telling my family I was going to, you know, potentially be uh, on the podcast, um, my daughter was like, now, what happened to you, dad? Um, so it just goes to show I, I she's heard a few basic things about kind of what happened to me, um, but uh, not something I really like to talk about a whole lot. Um, traumatic uh experiences um but uh but i think they're important to share so uh we can kind of dive into those but um i guess also we did our kind of faith deconstruction in around 2020 when when COVID hit you know a lot of people were a lot of members of the ward and, and area were super sad that they couldn't go to church and we were just kind of 
really? You know, we're, we're kind of enjoying this. Uh, but, but no, uh, a lot of different experiences kind of led to where we are now. But uh, um, yeah, um, we can kind of just dive right into my mission experience if you want. Your story, yeah. So I went to Brazil and uh, um, was there between 2003 and 2005. And this, all this fun stuff that happened um, happened in July of 2004. Um, and, uh, to back up just a little bit, um, to kind of, I guess, just explain how things were, were for me. Um, I had been out for about 18 months, uh, roughly and, uh, uh, in a really hot area of Brazil. So like, you know, like just sweating all the time, but, um, as far as just like some of my, um, just like what we were experiencing um so we had we were um asked to we were not asked but kind of told that we needed to have 200 contacts every week and uh our area was probably two to two and a half hours on foot um and so crazy huge area um i was training a new missionary from brazil um made it a little easier to run the language um the language uh issues that you have with someone that's uh, American, but uh, was definitely like starting to have some stress on the mission. Um, and, and really the biggest thing to just kind of paint the picture is that, you know, we really believed that we we're there to bring salvation to everybody, right? And if we don't open our mouths, they're gonna be lost or lose the opportunity. So there was there was pressure going on. And, uh, and so I started having, I again, been out 18 months, I, I started having like spells where I would like feel dizzy or just not feel super good. I think partially due to the heat, but ultimately mm -hmm. largely due to the stress of the responsibilities. That was, uh, that was, I think what kind of started to trigger some health issues. I started losing a bunch of weight and, uh, anyway, uh, ended up going to see a doctor kind of in the downtown area of, of where we were. And, uh, he, this is just kind of my funny story. I want to lighten this up a little bit because it gets kind of dark. Um, but anyway, this, this doctor thought it would be a good idea for me to um, bring him like a 24 or 48 hours supply of all of my urine. So we, so grab two liter bottles, right? Start filling those <laughs> bottles up and, uh, and then we take the bus everywhere, right? So we hop on the bus got these bottles and I think there was a bag that I was holding them in but um I don't know how it happened but some leaking started going down while we're on the bus so that was a <laughs> kind of a crazy story but like it's yeah, Mountain yeah. Dew it's Mountain Dew <laughs> no, everybody it's, it's, oh my gosh despite the fact that it doesn't say Mountain Dew on it but no. um but anyway uh so yeah taking my you know a couple days worth of urine on a bus <laughs> to a doctor was 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 something that we just kind of joked about after that. Um, but, uh, and I have no recollection of what the results were like, um, the, the people in our area that, you know, when I would say, yeah, I'm not feeling super good, they would, they would, we, I checked my blood pressure and it was a little high. And so they'd say, Oh, you've got to watch your salt content. Like you've got to make sure you have a handle on that and stuff. So that was kind of my thought was, Oh, I'm probably Brazilians like to salt their food. And so I'm probably, having too much salt, not even realizing it was just due to stress. So yeah. nothing crazy happened there, right? Um, but kind of a precursor as to what will happen after the experience that I share with you guys. Um, we can, should we dive right into that? Um, yeah, let's do it. Do you want us to pull up any slides as you start talking? Or? Yeah, let's show the area okay. just a little bit. Yeah, kind of Dave had like, sent us some you know, pictures that are awesome, so. The interesting thing is that uh, yeah, there's there's a new subdivision being built, like government housing, these little tiny cookie cutter sp spaces. They wouldn't even like finish the flooring. I mean, it would just be concrete, uh, just very basic, very humble. I mean, the the um, you know that's the road, right? They they didn't even pave the roads. There was actually one street um, that had a big huge tree in the middle of it, so they weren't even cutting down trees for the roads. And a drive yeah. around it like that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and, and most people didn't have cars, but let's, let's, uh, maybe go to the next one. Um, we're going to get to kind of the area where we had our problem. 
there's just another one of kind of the you got a house is kind of in the distance and then there's just a bunch of kind of open land um maybe you cruise to the next and here's where where uh, ground zero was for us so um this is a, a pathway and so we have pictures of this area because it was pretty funny for us to cross and get out to the other side you got to go over this obstacle course of tires and logs and if you're lucky you won't step in the huge mud puddles that are right there um and uh, maybe we can just go to a couple more oh, there you are on, on a rainy day so we got a lot are of you holding an umbrella there. Is that an umbrella? Yeah, that's my umbrella, yeah. A big umbrella, okay. It stopped, stopped raining. Um, and then there's a couple other elders and I just walked out their, their faces, but uh, yeah, there's me on the uh, balancing on the on the log there. So and no one fixed yeah. the road. Like that's just how everybody walked. Every that's just how it was. <laughs> well, that so that right there was our, our ticket to going between the area and saving ourselves about 20 minutes of time. So, oh, so you're off the beaten path trying to make a shot for sure. But it did okay. just up from the, the, that whole thing is the area where we spent a lot of time teaching. And so it, it was just kind of easy for us to take this path and, and again, save ourselves like 20 minutes. Otherwise we'd be kind of going totally out of our way to go on the main roads. Um, so we did that every day and, you know, thought it was a funny place to take photos. So we did and, and didn't realize this would be kind of where we experienced the, uh, pretty traumatic experience um and i can uh kind of start with that if you want to i wonder if there's another photo still that's a good oh, photo because the bridge at the very top of where you see the path at the top of the photo that's where this this experience took place oh um, my goodness so you can definitely just see that there's not not much around and uh kind of just there's there aren't any homes really nearby there just I think some banana trees and some people would do a little farming there, but um, pretty, pretty desolate feeling right there. Um, but felt totally safe. I mean, we, it was again, the way we'd go home every night and that could be a problem um, as to why we were, why we were targeted. Um, did, did the sisters walk in the same type of conditions uh, as the elders or did they have? Well, you know, it wouldn't shock me if there were other areas like this in other, in other um, parts of, the city or, or mission um but there were just elders in the, these areas so I'm not totally sure and and again it just you know even though it's very rural looking and poor there just wasn't much concern for safety we felt safe honestly so okay. anyway so uh, should we dive right into? Yeah, let's, give let's you dive right in. I think yeah. you set the scene. So, You're an awesome then, missionary, and you've got your uh, companion yeah. from the and country, a, and you're ready. To, yeah, you're doing what you need follower. to do. I, I'm enjoy. You know, I, I believe in the rules. Yeah. Um, we'll get into this, but maybe I'll just say that you know uh, my patriarchal blessing says you know make sure to follow the rules when you're a missionary, and so I was like, yeah, I'm gonna follow the rules, right? No reason not to. I didn't really feel super rebellious and so the rule was to always be home at 9 30 we're a walking mission so you just have to plan right to make sure you get home in time so um at nine o'clock at night on july 28th so we're coming up on, on the 20th anniversary of this thing um uh we were teaching a discussion to a guy that was interested and left left his house at nine um, I think I already in my head knew that we were going to be a little bit late, um, but we start walking home and uh, walking home fast. Um, and uh, we get to probably about 920 ish and we come to the top of that that uh, hill there where you got the pathway and uh, two guys, we could see two guys ahead of us and we, you know, didn't, I didn't really think much of it. Just, oh, there's people on the path too. we'll say hi to them or something. And uh, they uh, stick a revolver out at us and tell us to get on the ground and uh, ask, tell us that we need to give them all of our money, everything we have, or else they're gonna they're gonna kill us. So super crazy, super freaky, and some, not something I think me or my companion had ever experienced before. So, um, so you're missionary, so you have a lot of stuff to give them, obviously. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I do have I do have written down in my journal. I 
after uh, I, I've kind of been going through my journal a lot to kind of just make sure I got everything right and, and uh, to, re to just kind of refresh my memory. And yeah, I did, I did write that uh, we just had our Book of Mormon and unfortunately they didn't really think too much of that. We just had our scriptures. So um so now that's not what like, we hear. We hear that's a very valuable that everybody wants. More that. precious, so, right? I know. Precious. <laughs> but they Maybe didn't if I see it so that way. Freaked out by being held at gunpoint for the first time in my life, I would have been like, "Hey, the real value is in this." Um, but they wanted they wanted the the money, so we had like uh, seven or eight. I guess I should just call it the Brazilian money. That hey, hey ice is what you call call that money. So you know, a few bucks. And, you know, they're not super happy about that. I don't know. I don't ever really know what their thought was if they were thinking, hey, you know, these businessmen are always in white shirts and ties and they're always coming mm -hmm. down this way every night. Let's <laughs> take them, take what they've got. They've got to have money. I'm not sure if that was their thought, um, but uh, they were not happy when we didn't have very much money. And so they told us to get up on the ground, put our hands over our heads, started kicking us around a bit. And one thing I'd, I'd kind of forgotten, um, but reread in my journal, is that they one of the guys especially seemed kind of really crazy. And uh, he took the other guy aside and was like, yeah, I think, I think we should just kill him or whatever. And they're whispering. And, I, and I'm just like, seriously, just, oh, my gosh, this could really end poorly. Um, my biggest worry was that we're just in the middle of kind of nowhere. Um, no homes around, just they can do whatever they want. And there was definitely thoughts of like, Oh, well maybe I could like run away or something, but then you know, you've got a companion and it's like, well, you don't want to just like abandon him or whatever. So um, anyway, yeah, that, that was, uh, that was the start of this thing. Um, and I have a, a I don't, I only have one little section of my journal that I, I want to just read here that just kind of, I don't know, kind of, pinpoints my lowest point at this point while we're kind of in the middle of this field uh, held at gunpoint. Um, I will also say these, these guys were probably about our age. They were young guys. They were dressed really kind of poorly, pretty shabby. And uh, at one point the, they, I mean, they would just stick the barrel of the gun in, at our heads and one of them pulled out the cartridge or their whatever and, and showed us the bullets and stuff. So we knew it was legit. It wasn't just, somebody with a fake gun or something. Um, so are you good if I start reading now then? Yeah, yeah. Okay. let us hear that. That's... Sounds good. So I wrote, um, at this point, I was in complete shock and amazement that my life was about to end. It was a feeling I had never felt before. I began to prepare myself mentally for death. At the same time, I was praying with all my might that we would be saved from such a violent and tragic death. I remembered my patriarchal blessing that states that I would have a successful mission and would go on living after my mission. I remembered my wife and kids whom I don't even have yet, but were promised to me. And as I remembered them, I felt peace that I would get out of this mess and go on to complete my mission here in Brazil and my mission in mortality. Sounds like a missionary, right? Um, and then I've got, uh, however, notwithstanding these feelings of peace, my companion and I were in the middle of a barren field in a really poor area at 930 at night with two drugged out maniacs who were pointing a gun at our heads, telling us we were about to die. This was the worst moment of my life. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, just to kind of, I guess, bring it home that, yeah, this was probably the worst think for me yet, right like I, I'd never encountered a, an experience that made me think I was going to die so definitely just freaked me out um and and then the rest of the story um I again I, I've been thinking it, did, is what I did next really stupid or was it really smart but I had an idea as these guys are still demanding more money from us if we could just get them somewhere where it's not super um where it's not super just barren, maybe they would be afraid to kill us, or maybe they, if we make them happy and give them a little bit more money, they'd leave us alone and not kill us. And so I was like, well, guys, I mean, like our place isn't too far away and you can take whatever you want there. Um, and whatever, they ended up kind of liking that idea. So they ended up uh, letting us kind of walk them to our house. And then we, 
unlock the gate to the yard and then uh, unlock the door to the house. And then once inside, they started kind of ransacking it, going after our stuff. Uh, took probably three or 400 bucks this time. Um, had a really, uh, like back in 2004, the digital cameras were just like coming out and they were like super cool. So I took my camera, they took some shoes and we're really just kind of in our house, kind of messing around for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, maybe, maybe even a little longer. What was your apartment? <laughs> was your apartment isolated or? It was a, it was a standalone single family home actually. Um, so, um, but you know, a small, like two or three bedroom house. And then in back of the house, there was a, a, uh, uh, little house that some people rented and that was actually part of my thought was that okay these guys are going to shoot us that'll, that'll make some noise or whatever and so i should you know if we could get into the house the things would be a little better and, and as we were walking into the house i i even said to the guys and this is something i forgot but i had written in my journal i was like well telling them hey gotta be quiet guys because we have neighbors that you're going to wake up if you're loud you know just kind of trying to put something Don't in their head yet. that they yeah. should they shouldn't <laughs> shoot us um, and, you know, looking back on it, if it saved our lives and maybe it would have, maybe it wouldn't have, maybe they would have left us anyway, what's 300 bucks and a digital camera, right? Like, so it ended up working out to, to you know, to at least where we, we didn't lose our lives. Okay. So these guys are in your house. They have you at gunpoint. You must've been scared to death. What happens next? Yeah, the whole time we're just thinking, freak, how's this going to end? Um, and so they, you know, are going through all of our stuff. Like I say, took some shoes, took one decided he wanted my digital camera. And for whatever reason, he he made me delete all the pictures um, that I had there. Um, and uh, while that's going on, um, I mean, we, we joked about it. You got to find something to laugh about. Um, the other dude was... Um, making my companion get out crackers and get some like cheese and some butter and like making him spread crackers, spread all that on crackers for him to eat. So we considered that to be kind of like the humiliating low point for him that he was kind of forced to demean himself like that. I guess it could have been worse, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but, I know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he's doing that. And, you know, the whole time we're just like, please leave us alone. Please just leave you know and and take whatever you want right i mean nothing i had a really cool watch that i liked that they took and you know for your life you know go ahead and have it right so eventually um they i also gave them a debit card and uh they're like if you know i gave them the code and they're like if we can't get money out of this we're going to come back to kill you we've got a friend that's going to be nearby watching um so better not leave um and then uh, they ended up uh, tying us with our, our bed sheets and uh, like hogtied. And uh, at, at some point I, I wrote in my journal that I had just closed my eyes and was just like praying the whole time that everything would work out. And, and I was, while I was doing that, um, they, we heard the door open and close and they were gone. Um, so I don't remember how long it was, but we, we sat there like freak they really leave like um are we gonna be okay um and eventually we were able to just kind of like untie our bed sheets and, and free ourselves um and i how, I, how long oh, were you how long were you with them total an hour two know, hours you know it's a hours? great question because um i wrote in my journal that by the time we were able to contact the people that lived in back of us it's already like midnight and so if it was about 9 30 that we encountered these guys then um yeah a couple hours i i think we may have just been like in shock in our apartment for a while too also like wanting to make sure that they had actually left um so i mean i think the whole thing was a couple hours um i think they were probably with us for an hour or a half ish roughly it probably seemed like forever yeah. though i can't even imagine exactly like, slow right motion, exactly. Like... You know, totally totally hard to figure out exactly how much time it was but by the time we ended up making it to our uh well i'll backtrack a little so after we tied untied ourselves i've forgotten about this and maybe this just is an illustration of how freaked out we were we just like hugged and uh, i'm not a hugger yeah. but no. <laughs> we just like hugged and then we said a yeah. prayer that we were so grateful we were alive 
and uh, and then went and called our, our mission president from the neighbor's phone. We didn't even have phones. We, I mean, like a phone in the house back then. And you think 20 years ago, you would have, but no, we didn't even have phones. So uh, and then he told us to file a police report, which we did the next day and basically just got ourselves out, out of there. We had the bishop of the ward come pick us up and we went to stay with the other elders for the night and and that and that was it um so yeah that was uh my my number one life altering experience i guess or a time where i really thought i was not gonna not gonna survive um did you so, call your parents? Yeah. Did they say, okay, elders, you better call your parents. Let's bond with your families. So Did, let anything me, like that? Let me first just say that I don't hold any resentment toward my mission president. Like he had just gotten to the mission. He'd been there for about three weeks when this happened. So this was like his first big thing oh he had gosh. to take care of. But no, we didn't call our parents. And I have a suspicion that my parents didn't find out until I, I wrote them a letter. Um, oh. I, uh, I, in my journal, it says that my mission president called my dad to let him know my debit card was stolen, <laughs> but I don't know if he even mentioned anything. About oh my goodness. Oh. So, you know, well, that was back in the much... day where they kind of protected, you weren't supposed to tell anything negative about the mission. You, you know, and nobody was calling home back then. It's and... hard to believe 2004 being back in the day, but I guess it was. <laughs> it, it, it's 20 it's years changed. ago. I know there, there have been changes for sure. Um, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Yeah. For sure. And I think all missionaries have cell phones and, and, yeah. and stuff. So, you know, things have changed. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, I think my parents found out because of me. Um, and I have regrets kind of scaring them like that. Um, but I just kind of felt like I had to share something that big with them. Oh, absolutely. Um, but did, uh, yeah. Um, did you get transferred? Did they send you back yeah. to the apartment where the guy yeah. said they were <laughs> going to come back? Home. You know, we <laughs> actually had, I think they, the other elders packed up all our stuff. What I, I guess what I, I should say, what was remaining, right? Like they didn't, yeah. these guys didn't want our white shirts or ties. I don't know. The think, scriptures. Uh, they didn't take any <laughs> scriptures. Go figure, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, we didn't have to go back to the house um, and we were transferred. My mission was really big. It, I mean, kind of feel like it's like the size of Montana-ish, like a big Utah state. And so this, and this was like the poor area of the mission. Um, and so we were transferred out of there to a different state and um, given new areas and we weren't companions anymore. We just each went to a different companion. There was somebody that was kind of sick. And so we took the places of them and, and, uh, and then really, you know, it was a horrible experience for me. Um, and I was just ready to be done. I wasn't recounting in my head all the crap that had happened to us. And I was like, okay, hey, let's move on. We're so grateful to be alive. Let's, uh, well, I've got six months left on the mission. Let's wrap, you know, wrap it up and, and do a great job, you know? So there was no kind of aftercare or talking to a, a therapist or any kind of wrap up. It was just, let's get back. And you yourself, yeah. felt, let's just get back to it. Let's just get yeah, back to and it. It's, as we dive into like what could have been done better yeah, um, hindsight. Right. But um, no, there wasn't any of that. Um, I mean, you know, we talked to the mission president probably for a while. I think we stayed at his house maybe for a couple of days while they were figuring out where we were going to go. Super nice. They were, they were great as far as like being hospitable or whatever, but there wasn't any, like, you know, we need to make sure that you guys, yeah. Well, maybe, and maybe they did say, Hey, are you okay? And we probably said, yeah, sure. We're fine. Yeah. You know? Um, and, and uh, we were just ready to get back. I mean, so it's all just about got to get back out there and work mm -hmm. and work and work. Um, and, and that was kind of, that was the plan. That was like what we were hoping to do. So, so yeah, but no um, discussion of needing to, have counseling or, or anything like that. So no church psychiatrist. Did they call, did they Not call a hotline? Did they call the church hotline to ask? What yeah, good question. I don't know. what. what yeah. The did they report did. it to the church even, or was yeah, it just deal with it here in the mission? How interesting would it be to know, you know, how, how many of these types of things happen? You know, they, they might be keeping track of these types of things, yeah. but we only hear about the ones that really end badly. Right. Where right. Exactly. Severely hurt or, you know, so, were so, you, yeah, uh, no, I, at this point, it was like, okay, we're 
grateful you're alive. You know, the, the missionaries that uh, were part of that we were with took over the rest of the ward and uh, we were, there were two, two sets of missionaries for the ward and they just became the two. They stayed in their house. And as far as work there that, you know, things just kept moving on. And then we had a new area and, and uh, honestly, I, 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 I didn't experience anything where I was like traumatized by being outside or by contacting mm-hmm. people, nothing like that. So mm-hmm. I was just ready to move on. But um, my uh, my brain, I guess, or my, my yeah. body had other things in mind. And, and that kind of goes into the next part of my story, which is honestly, as I think about it, when it's all said and done, potentially more traumatic than even this crazy assault that we had. Uh, this assault happened couple hours terrifying thought I could die um after though uh, it was it was done you know Um, I feel like you go on autopilot kind of and you think I've got this I'm okay especially with all the pressures and responsibilities of the missionary nothing's supposed to stop you or slow you down illness anything you know you go 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 I feel like you kind of go in autopilot and you're just back out there and I also feel like people think that's the healthy thing to do right get back on the horse that I mean I think I keep saying back in the day and it is only 20 years, but I feel when it comes to missionaries, that was the idea. What's going to be good totally for you was. is the work and to yeah. be with your friends and companions, just go. Get and back they, out there and now, do those. Exactly. Now they have, you know, mental health counselors, supposedly over different missions. We've talked to some of those and it's a different, I think they're starting to become more aware. Um, sure. Unfortunately, based on experiences like yours, where it went sure. very differently, but I can see the mission president thinking, they seem fine. What's best for them is the work, you know, and you probably felt the same way. Yeah. I'm just going to get back out yeah, there, you know, and you don't through. know, how do you know what is happening in your head? You've never had that experience before. So true. Right. That's the most traumatic experience I've ever had up yeah. to that point. And, and, uh, I, um, but I will say though, that, you know, like I explained, uh, I was stressed before this started mm-hmm. and what this was, was basically just, a. It, it just took me over the edge wow. and it, it's interesting um with anxiety and ptsd that it doesn't happen um just immediately after it's not like just something that just i had this thing happen to me and now i'm totally messed up and right. can't function or whatever i got to my new area and we were it was a good couple weeks um into the area when i had another freaky experience um that i can share um so um my new area was a lot smaller and it, it really just kind of had a cool feel to it i was i read my journal and i was writing about how i, I really liked being there um wasn't worried or anything and uh we went to develop some film in the center of town and so we go into this into this uh film developing store and drop our film off i can't even it's hard to even cut, put the words together because we don't do that anymore but um then we we dropped it off and then uh and then uh left and went out into the bright sunlight and i'd gone from a dark space to a light space and it triggered something in me and i all of a sudden um had a hard time speaking and i couldn't think straight and i was just like what the heck is going on and like a stroke also, or something i wonder if you thought am i having a stroke am i you oh, can't yeah, think we'll you can't that. talk yeah we'll get there. And so, yeah, I'm thinking all those things and, and, and my vision is getting blurry. And so I'm like, what the heck is going on? My mind didn't go to, Oh, you just had a horrible assault experience. Yeah. Why my mind know? went to, Oh, before the assault, they were telling me I needed to wash my salt intake. <laughs> and mm-hmm. and that's why my blood pressure is, is, is oh. high or whatever, you know? And, uh, so we were not too far from like this little clinic, this hospital, and uh and so we walked down there and, and i think we have a, a slide of that um if we want to show that one um yeah, let's look it oh just, okay like going to this little hospital it just kind of freaked me out because uh, um you know just really primitive looking it looked like a 19th century house but we go in and, and start i start talking to a doctor um and uh do you guys have the slide up yes uh, can you not I'm see in a different I'm in a different a different uh, window. Yeah, we have the window. slide. It looks like a house, but okay. you're telling yeah, us yeah. that's actually the okay, hospital. Got, okay. As long as you've got it. Yeah, that's the hospital. Yeah, we've got so, it. And the viewers can And I actually see. just found that on Google. I didn't take a picture of that. I just okay. uh, just found that. But but anyway, so we're talking to a doctor and uh, and he's like, well, you know, I, I want to give you a shot and it should take care of you and calm you down. And I said to him, well, we can't 
have any medical attempt. We can't have shots and stuff without permission from our mission president. And he misunderstood me and thought that I meant that our religion didn't allow for those types of treatments. Oh, and so this no. guy started like yelling at me, like, well, what, what do you want me to do then? I mean, there's nothing I can do. And, and, and the, the additional anxiety that came up with him yelling at me really set me over the edge. And my entire like left side started to tighten up on me and around my heart was tightening up. Oh. And I, it, I mean, it was freaky. I've never not been in control of my body, but it was just something that was happening to me that I had no control over. And so I freaked out and and told my companion what was happening. And and, and then they just kind of said, well, we're giving you something to calm you down. So, um, and again, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm having a stroke or right. a heart, heart attack, attack or something. Or, yeah. And uh, sure enough, you know, the medication does calm me down. Uh, but that was, that was my initial episode that, honestly freaked me out as much as the assault, honestly, Mm -hmm. Um, something that's just totally out of my control. It took years and years to figure out, but what actually happened was that, you know, because of the anxiety um, from this experience, um, going from a dark lit room to a bright room was actually an ocular migraine that had triggered. And you, you think of migraines as being something that lasts for days and hours and they're incredibly painful but this type of migraine for me manifests itself in the blurry vision can't think straight can't talk straight even and uh and it is a thing you know eventually i stumbled upon that so you know it's not just that the the ptsd will cause anxiety attacks or panic attacks but you know it can trigger things that you've never experienced in your life before and uh that was something that you know for the whole mission we just thought that was all anxiety attack panic attack but in reality it was something else and now i know how to how to handle it when they come on and and it's something that unfortunately i've experienced uh, ever since Um, oh really yeah yeah but but the first time it had ever happened you know just just right after this assault so um so yeah i you know i can kind of dive into the next few weeks it took time to figure out what was wrong with me but eventually we did figure out I spent a couple of days in the hospital because I was uh, you know they're trying to figure out what was wrong trying to and figure did you out talk to your parents was. at that oh, point ever. now you're having a medical incident yeah yeah no talks with my parents no t- oh my god so, yeah it's insane did, did um, the mission home send anybody out to see you or check so there, there was a traveling uh, doctor that was in, in South America and he, uh, we had a bunch of phone conversations and he's the one that kind of taught me that, you know, yeah, this assault thing just kind of tipped, just there comes a point where your body just can't handle all the stress and this assault made it to where you started having these panic attacks and, and these uh, crazy things. Uh, and so we had a bunch of phone conversations and then got me on a, on a, um, anxiety, anti-anxiety med and, and, uh, slowly, but surely after about a month or so, I kind of stopped having the, the anxiety attacks and, um, and was able to just kind of move, move on from there. I, you know, one thing I want to stress is that, um, so many, like, I don't know if I've ever prayed harder in my life, but we're talking, the medication, the, the anxiety meds and the counseling is what did the trick. Right. Um, right. And that's all trick. after your mission. That's not on your mission. <laughs> right. Right. So, so yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah. That is quite the experience. And I just, you know, I, I think back, I mean, you're, how old are you right there? You're 18 20. months in. So you're just 20. Yeah. I mean, like Landon and I say, that's a kid, isn't it, Landon? That's, we sure. both have sons that age. I just can't imagine them going through that kind of experience and having parents not be aware, not giving support, not calling, not understanding the medical situation, being able to weigh in. Can you even imagine that, Landon? Landon and I have sons that are the very same age, 20, that same yeah. age. Yeah, no, you know, it's, it's difficult. I was actually wondering because in my mission, we had some elders that were robbed. Um, and it's it's kind of a 
it's kind of a funny story. Um, they, <laughs> uh -huh. but, but not really, but, uh, it, it, it turned into a funny story in the mission. They, they did a skit about it at zone conference. Oh my but, gosh. Uh, the, 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 you so made the a process. Yeah. One of the elders woke up in the middle of the night and heard some noise and he went in the kitchen and there's a big guy in there going through all their stuff. And, uh, of course, it's a missionary apartment, so there's nothing to steal. No stuff. You know, <laughs> uh, so uh, the guy's like, uh, you know, what what do you have? And he's like, I got a phone. So the guy stole the phone. Uh, he took the <laughs> phone. That was about the only thing we're taking in a missionary apartment. But he basically told the guy, you go back to bed and go to sleep and, and I won't hurt you. So the elder went back to bed. <laughs> Never woke up his companion. That's what I would have done. I mean, oh I would have woken up my companion, but yeah. the next day the companion wakes up and goes in and goes, Where's the phone? He goes, Oh yeah, this big guy was in the apartment last night and stole it. I'm sure he thought, did you dream that? I mean, yeah, you would think you're so, so out of your mind. You're just was not there a, was there thinking. a gun involved? No, there, I, I don't think there was a gun. I think he was just a large guy, you know, large that was threatening. That's, that's yeah, good. yeah, yeah, yeah so. for sure. So yeah, it, sure. it kind of went down in mission lore, you know, those type yeah. of things that happen kind of go down in mission lore. So I was wondering if it, you know, if that story spread through the it, mission and it, it was known it, for years yeah. or. And honestly, you know, it's at least my perception of it was, you know, people are kind of making fun of us over what happened. Like in the, we yeah. should have been strong. We should have like, uh, you know, to, to take a point from uh, the Mormon newscast, you know, there weren't any, there weren't any Lamanite, right angels surrounding us scaring these guys off right there, there was none of that going down um and then you have this like thought of oh well if i had had the spirit of discernment maybe we oh, would have known goodness. that we should go the yeah. wrong way and yeah had we left that that meeting five minutes earlier we would have oh, been my goodness. home by 9 30 and so there's all that crap that you yeah. kind of internalize and uh and things did, that, did, uh, do you uh, feel that was self-induced or do were people telling you elder you, you, you know, know if i'm being totally honest been home you know yeah if i'm being totally honest i don't even know if we told people that we were running a little late because we knew they would probably so you never talked about it case. so we didn't really talk about it so it would have been something i influenced myself for sure and then you know i have a pa my patriarchal blessing came up in the in the journal entry um about you know i i I was told i would have a family and that kind of gave me hope but um it also said make sure that you're obeying all the rules and so i thought in my head oh, oh that's what that was there for you know oh my god and, you know now i'm like okay yeah 20 year olds are just kids but back mm -hmm. then you know you don't really see yourself no like, just a kid and and it's a you know there's as missionaries you're expected to just be perfect and as i've been reading my journal about just so many entries of oh i'm just so imperfect i'm just trying my best but I'm fighting with my companion and and, you know, going through this, going through that, I wish I could be perfect. And I'm just thinking, dude, you're 20. <laughs> you're, you're doing just fine. Like, I, I, I wish I, you know, in hindsight, right, you wish you could tell your younger self, just chill. But yeah, yeah, Isn't that a, true? You're, yeah. you're on a mission. You're sharing the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're, you're obeying every rule. You've got the law of chastity, the word of wisdom. You're not drinking. You're not smoking. You're not sleeping around. You're not doing any of the things that regular kids do. And yet you're asking yourself, oh, I'm, I'm just oh, not good enough. I'm, I'm not good enough yeah. still. Yeah. Well, it makes me think of about a, probably what, a year and a half ago or so, we did an episode about the um, documentary film, The Return of Elder Pingree, um, diary or memoir of a departed mormon and he was in guatemala El Salvador, El Salvador, no no not el salvador guatemala? guatemala maybe guatemala i think he was in guatemala anyway he is a um emmy award making winning filmmaker and he returned to his mission um to you know film and document and kind of talk to people and say you know i've stepped away from the church so there's this beautiful film where there are scenes from his mission there are journal entries, kind of like what you're reading. And then he goes back and he talks to people and then he waits like another seven years to even put the whole film together. And that's part of it is just, what would I tell my younger self? What would I say? How do I interpret my experiences then? And when I revisited um, 15 years later, and then when I you know put it all together, but um, it made Landon get his journals out to start reading and you hadn't read them 
prior to that, had you? No, I, you I pretty have, much since I've he wouldn't come touch home, him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so you know he was reading me passages because we were thinking, oh, we're going to do an episode maybe on this. Landon breaks open his journal, you know, and we did. But the thing that struck me is like, I mean, and Landon was such a straight laced kid. I can't imagine anybody like didn't date, didn't do anything because he's trying to do everything perfectly. But by the like third day in the MTC, he's reading me this entry and it says, I feel so guilty. And I'm like, what? Why? I mean, you know, you go into this system, this institution, and you're instantly, though you're such a good kid by anybody's standards, like too good, honestly, too squeaky clean. Yeah. And you're like, I'm racked with guilt. I mean, right. I didn't go on a mission, but I just can't even imagine the psychological, psychologically, what is happening in your brain to make you feel that way. How could we possibly learn that, right? Where could we have yeah. learned that? Yeah, where could we get <laughs> <Yeah>. that? <laughs> and, and anyway, it's sad. Over, it's a really sad mentality because what any missionary does is amazing. No matter sure. where they go or yeah. their circumstance, it's incredible what they're sacrificing and, and what they do and all the good that they do. And it's so sad that this extreme guilt is part of it. And then- you know, what happened to you? That's just a whole different story. Right. But do you ever think so, about, was it two years ago or so? Um, maybe a year and a half in Mexico. Do you remember the story about there was a zone meeting and some armed gunmen broke in and they held like 70 missionaries captive. They beat up the mission president, beat up the mission president's wife, I think, you know, stole, robbed everybody. And I just remember that being reported and kind of thinking, okay, what are, you, what are you doing for these 70 missions? I mean, that's a large number of people and they're all going to have different reactions. They all have different yeah. personalities. And I hope there's some care there because that's yeah. a huge number of people to have that horrific experience like yours. I think that's a great point to bring up that you, your reaction to something traumatic is going to be depend, it's, it's going to depend on who you are as a person and where you're at in right. your life. Like, you know, I was already stressed out with just the regular yeah. mission life. And so that triggered me. And I, and I, and I can say with certainty that anxiety kind of runs in my family. My uh, companion, you know, he uh, was totally freaked as freaked out during the experience with me, but he didn't ever have the same issues that, that I had. So, you know, it's interesting how different people are affected and, and you have to just kind of, you learn about yourself when you go through something like this. And, and it takes a long time to, kind of not be hard on yourself where you're like, oh, I wish I was stronger like this guy or whatever. These people are thinking I'm crazy because I'm having these weird episodes, but, but it's a real sort of PTSD is a real thing and, mm -hmm. and it needs to be treated appropriately. And, uh, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, if there was maybe a little more probing as to what I was experiencing, could we have maybe pinpointed that, Oh, you're having an ocular migraine. And then those crazy manifestations are giving you anxiety. Maybe I could have spared myself, you know, a lifetime of having to be on anxiety meds. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I'm glad they're there. But, you know, once you go on, they're hard to come off. The, yeah. the one real big relapse I had, I've had since my mission was about nine years ago when I was really just like, you know, I just want to be done with medication. I'm going to go off of this. And it was really, really bad. <laughs> Yeah. Only going back on the medication and making a few changes with my doctor uh, got me back and to where I haven't had any many issues since. Uh, but and again, during that time, you know, priesthood blessings yeah. those didn't help, but the, the medication does. Yeah. Um, do you feel do you feel like your all those experiences and everything that you experienced afterwards trying to deal with what what happened to me? Do I have PTSD? What kind of medication will work? How does that play into then like eventual? Well, I mean, okay, so first of all, was being a member of the church helpful? Was it were you supported like in your ward and stuff where people like, oh, you know, we're gonna try to help you if you have these issues? Or did it kind of play into more of your deconstruction? Or how does that kind of fit together? Wow, that's those are some pretty <laughs> a loaded amazing questions. <laughs> There's a lot to kind of digest. There. I'm just curious because sometimes so, people don't understand. You know, they it, don't. They you don't know, here understand. I, here I am on a podcast, right? Telling telling this, and and I want this to kind of go out there if if it can be helpful to anybody. Yeah. But this isn't something I like to talk about. <laughs> so I don't know if very many people understood have understood what I've kind of gone through besides yeah. my close family. And they've been very, very supportive. My wife has, you know, since we've been married so long, like 
she was around, she was, she came along for the ride with some of these anxiety attacks that I'd have. And, and, and honestly, though, I'm telling you, these ocular migraines and, and for years we didn't know. So I would just insist that I was having a stroke mm-hmm. or something crazy, but she'd say, no, it's anxiety. You're just, it's mm-hmm. an anxiety mm-hmm. attack, which I mean, it kind of was They're, They kind of correlate, but, uh, but as far as like people in the community, um, not really something I share that just kind of more private. Yeah, that is so interesting. It, oh, so much to unpack there. So, and then as far as deconstruction, how did that all kind of come about and related to the experience even from 20 years ago and what had happened? Yeah. Then? Yeah. Um, you know, this is something that I've kind of been uh, dealing with just lately. Um, you know, this is a, an experience I like to think about a lot, but as I knew I would potentially be sharing it, I, uh, been thinking about it more now than I have since it happened. And, uh, just kind of thinking, okay, so you have missionaries that put their lives on the line. I mean, they, they give up their lives for two years. They, um, are just, it's just, you know, 70, 80, I was calculating how many hours a week missionaries are are out there working hard and, or studying. And, uh, you know, in my case, (laughs) potentially give up your whole life for, you know, lose your life for this. Um, and you know, when you're in the church, you're, you know, taking one for the Lord and, a trial but you get through it and you're protected and you have that viewpoint of how you were watched over um and uh ultimately i was able to get through the anxiety as well and then finish up but you know just it, finish up my mission all right looks like rebecca's uh, internet's acting up so she dropped off uh, but uh, now we can talk openly about her <laughs> so, <laughs> so you were talking about your deconstruction you want to uh, tell us a little yeah. bit more about that yeah, just, you know, as, as I got into, first got into Mormonism Live and then all of our FM's episodes and uh, now Mormonish and, and some of John DeLynn's, uh great uh, interviews, um, you know, you look at these traumatic experiences a little differently, like, oh, well, this is something that I deal with constantly in my life. I um, now have to deal with and you know not that other things couldn't have come up to where you experience anxiety and stuff but but just uh, you know a lot of a lot of thoughts um about how the church wants everything from its missionaries before you go it's we want to know everything that you've done in your past you got to make sure everything's right um and then when you're as a missionary inviting people to be baptized interviewing them for baptism they've got to confess everything that they've done or whatever that they need to repent of to you but the church has no accountability as far as their uh, misdeeds and 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 painting a true history or an accurate uh accounting of their of their history and 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 that's where there's some resentment for sure it's like you know they they ask um we ask too much of our missionaries to not be totally honest with them and and i think uh you know I, I was reading through my preach my gospel and stuff, and there's just nothing on encountering people that have um, some of the information that the church doesn't want you to know. There's nothing about overcoming objections of, of some of the crazy stuff that's happened in the church history. W- one other quick story. Um, my dad uh, read, he's since passed away, but I was reading one of his journals and uh, he encountered some guy and uh, on his mission who was telling him, about Brigham Young preaching the Adam God theory, uh, Adam God doctrine, and, and uh, Joseph Smith had teenage wives, and, and a couple other things that I can't remember. My dad just thought this guy was crazy. That, that mm-hmm. This uh, this guy would, would would have this information and that it was all completely false. But in reality, it was totally totally legit. So um, just kind of sad that we have missionaries out there that don't really know the truth and and uh, are just kind of teaching the whitewashed version of, of church history. Um, totally understand why the church doesn't want to put all that out there, but it's definitely dishonest. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think the experience you had, um, the, the, the church likes to say, oh, a mission is a very safe place. Um, and, you know, the experience you had where you were physically uh, uh, assaulted, that that is probably a fairly rare uh, occurrence. I think I think it happens more than the church wants us to know. Uh, but you know, for most missionaries, they don't un- undergo something like you went through. However, as a mental 
mentally safe place to go? I know all kinds of people who came sure. back really struggling. And in your case, your physical also turned into a mental yeah. uh, issue. But a lot of people sure. come home with the mental issues of yeah. the guilt, the shame. I'm not doing enough. I'm not righteous enough. Uh, or they don't want to be there and they come home and their neighbors and their friends are all are asking and they're ashamed of, of coming home. And that makes them, uh, you know, have that mental, you know, struggle for, for years. And, and I think that's really the telling. And, and we've heard numbers, uh, you know, like 20% or so of missionaries are coming home uh, related to mental uh issues uh you know psychologically being damaged uh and and are they is it because of the self you, you know the self-evaluation you're doing the whole time on your mission that it's depressing sure. or or what it's hard to say um so there's, do you think oh go ahead there's gonna there's you know talk of all these great missionaries right that baptize so many people and and you can be like that too yeah um there's a lot of uh just making the missionary into what they want you to be, you know, yeah, obviously your attire is all the same and they really kind of stamp out a lot of individuality and, and there's no time to think about anything other than, than the mission. And, and, and so that, and, and, and I just, I still just can't believe like 70 hours plus a week is what mm -hmm. they put in. It's that's exhausting. Um, with, with no so success much... in a lot of cases, and that is really yeah. depressing to your yeah. psyche when you work that hard right. and you're praying and you're doing everything and you keep meeting with nothing but rejection. And then yeah. you're told, well, it's not because it's the message that nobody wants. It's you. You're not doing what you should be. Yeah, right. And uh, yeah, no, I've been reading in my journal about, you know, area general authorities coming to the mission and teaching us what we need to be doing better, you know, not a whole lot of, Hey, you guys are doing great. Um, it's more just like, you need to do this. You need to do that. Um, you need to up these numbers. Um, so, so yeah, definitely not super surprising that you got so many that, that come, come home with, uh, you know, diminished self-worth. Yeah. Sure. I, that's, that's a great point too. I don't think I've ever heard of a general authority coming to a mission where it's a pep talk. It's always, <laughs> a, it's always a, you know, here's what you guys need to do better. Here's what you're not doing right. Here's how you get the spirit better so you can teach better and improve your, improve your baptism rates, you know? Sure. Uh, so. They'll throw in an, I love you probably, but or yes. we love you, but, but ultimately, yeah, they're there to try and just increase numbers and, get you to yeah so um Re rebecca uh asked me to ask you this she said um do you think that the church is making strides they've recently you know they've got some safety programs that they've implemented uh they, there's we've learned mental health professionals for at least regions of missions if maybe well, not every mission has one but regional ones what what's your take on that yeah, you know, I don't know a whole lot about what's going on, even though we have some nieces and nephews that go out. Um, you know, it's it's always just painting that rosy picture of how everything's great, right? A lot of trying, not trying to talk about, you know, some of those things, but but if that's what's happening, that's wonderful. That's that's great. I mean, I think the being able to call home more is is great. Um, and I know a lot of personal, I, I know people that have really struggled with with being out, and I, I think it's. I, for the most part, been a good thing that they've done that. So, uh, going into this, I'm, I'm literally just like, I'm not really sure how things are right now with, with what they're doing. Um, but all those things are, uh, sound great to me. Yeah. I, I think being connected also helps. Cause that was one of the things I was thinking about with your story is, you know, th this isn't happening you know, in a culture that you're familiar with. This happened in a language that you, isn't your native language, even though you'd been there 18 months, you probably understood a lot of what was going on, but it's not your native language. It's not your native country. You don't have the people that you would go to normally for the support that you would want sure. on something like this there. And you're not allowed to call them at the same time. Yeah. Uh, you and get so, doctors that want to collect your urine in two liter bottles. And yeah, you carry right. that to them. Yeah, that's no, right. they, they definitely had some weird ways of going about stuff for sure. 
and and that you know that's why you you know you said your companion didn't go through that i think sometimes it's just a matter of you know you're out of your culture they're sure. they're in their culture even though a bad thing happened to both of you he may have sure. some safeties that you don't um and and i think it's like you said everyone takes things differently or w what position they're in at the time yeah. it happens so and i mean it i'm oh, sorry no de definitely it's uh it, it's it could happen to anyone and and sure. you know i i learned that in the military um the ptsd can happen to the strongest soldiers um, it, it, it really has nothing to do with your mental toughness. Uh, it, it just has to do with what you saw and, and, and how that triggered your brain. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think moving forward, you know, looking back at my experience, you know, maybe they, maybe they already are doing this, but a good idea would be to tell these missionaries, don't just go home the same way every night, you know, when it's dark, you know, and, and if it looks fishy and sketchy, even if you feel comfortable doing it switch it up a little bit um, or even to the point where maybe the missionaries should be living further away and they move in, go into these other areas, you know, to work and, um, you know, and, and then don't get me started on, you know, the white shirt tie uniform. I feel like that does a lot of, I, I don't know, that uh, just kind of seems like, you know, you're kind of just stand out so much more. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that's one of the things, uh, you know, I, I have guys traveling all over the world. And I mean, the first thing you get in any safety briefing as you go into a foreign country is don't stand out. Don't look like you're a target. Don't make yourself a target. Yeah, right. When you're wearing a white shirt and a tie in a poor country, you're making yourself a target. Yeah. Um, now, maybe a lot of people say, oh, that's those Mormon missionaries. They're poor. They don't have anything. So there's no reason. But you, when you dress like that in a poor country, you look like you're someone who has wealth and, and that looks like somebody who would be a target. Which could have ultimately been why we were targeted. I mean, we, we again, just don't know what they thought of us when, yeah. when they started this thing, but that definitely, definitely stands to reason that they were expecting us there, that they knew that that's where we cross every night. And it, it's a pain in the butt to go 20 minutes out of your way to get home, but if it's going to spare you from some of these experiences, maybe it's good just to switch up that. that yeah, but I, I, I don't think there's anywhere where you can go where you walk 20 minutes where there's not some portion that's not well lit or. Sure. Yeah, no, be, so true. Could be targeted. So you always want to second guess yourself and say, oh, if I'd have done this or if I'd have done that, you know, uh, a much safer way would be if you were provided cars or vehicles right. so that you could go totally from the door to that. your door without, you know. Yep. experiencing that totally but, thought about that i mean yeah. and if we all just have the spirit of prophecy right i mean if we all just were in tune so much we'd all just get these promptings all the time that we need to go there here go there but it just doesn't work that way <laughs> no no it doesn't and and i think for sister missionaries especially that that even doubles it when you hear a story like yours that something like that could happen to them and we, uh i was actually in the movie theater when the trailer uh, for this uh, heretic movie played is the first time I've seen it at the movie theater. And it, it was here in Utah. And there was just this gasp in the audience of, because oh, they, as soon as they saw Mormon missionaries right. were in it and that they were being, uh, you know, targeted by this madman, you could tell they were very uncomfortable by that thought. Um, and, and that's why the church doesn't want anyone telling, you know, what happened uh, and, and keeping these stories from telling their parents and whatnot, because, you know, it, when, when people hear that, they, they get very nervous and they, they, yeah. I think they recognize, Oh, that is a very vulnerable situation that, that those sisters would be in. Uh, yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of horrific stories out there. I'm sure that they don't, they like to just keep things under wraps. Right. Um, nothing to see here. Um, so, and, uh yeah um i i just you know the the chances that you know you're knocking on doors you're trying to get into people's homes and the chances that you're going to come across some psycho person you know well, could happen you know? yep. so it, it's, it's scary uh, it, it's going to happen two years of knocking doors you're going to run into people that you're going to have some not people that you w would typically want to have an interaction with uh, sure absolutely and that that's just the reality of of knocking doors on, on a mission or anywhere and it else. just yeah yeah 
and, and, and again, just going back to the whole deconstruction, when you really just learn, I mean, like, you know, how many times are you reciting the Joseph Smith first vision story without even knowing there are other versions? <laughs> like, that was crazy to me. You know, how many times did I tell people how the Book of Mormon was translated and that's not how it went down and, and so on and so forth. You can just keep going. Um, I have major resentment that, that, uh, that I was not trusted enough to, to, to know those things. And, you know, maybe it would have made me be like, Hey, this isn't for me. This, this is crazy. You know, maybe yeah. that's, you know, it's going to lead people out of the church, but when it comes right down to it, our honesty, right? Like got to be honest and, and they're not being honest. Uh, well, for you, it must be truth. for you, it must be especially difficult because you're going, I almost died right? for something that I now yep. don't believe even happened. I so almost I died and didn't, message. didn't know all this stuff that, uh, that they've kept from me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, for sure. Well, Dave, we appreciate you coming on the show. We know this wasn't easy and it, it was something you, you had to think about and, and, and consider as to you know you share this with a audience of <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who, uh, a very vulnerable situation to put yourself in but uh great story to to just hear you know how these things happen and yeah uh, that they do happen out there yeah and that uh you know there's not something wrong with you if you if you start having uh anxiety problems after something like this uh you know it's okay to Get treatment and and it's okay to I, I think just by talking about it kind of helps and uh so yeah, yeah i and appreciate it, you guys letting me come on and sh share my story a little bit yeah and that's important what you said if uh, you know if this happens to anyone or, or they know someone that that happened it's important that they seek the help right away because even though they may not like you say experience it immediately uh down the road you can have it may have an impact on you and you don't know when or where. So it's, it's at least uh, you should, you should talk to a professional and, sure. and share where you're at uh, and, and document what's happened so that uh, you, you kind of have a baseline to, to draw from in the future. And honestly, you know, I probably could have benefited from counseling over the years, like right after the mission, but after my initial few visits with uh, the guy that the church had talked to me, uh, that was it. And, and I think, uh, I probably could have benefited quite a bit from talking to a professional, you know, when I'd have these panic attacks and have him or her explain kind of why they happen and, and why that's not super crazy after a traumatic experience. Did, did the church ever offer to pay for counseling or continued counseling? <laughs> once you, you know, went? they did pay for the medication I was on for several months afterwards and okay. they may have offered it and I may have, I may have said, ah, I think I'm good. That's kind of my personality. So I, I would think that they probably did. Okay. But I, well, I can't hear. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's, you know, important when it's a situation like that, that For sure. the right financial support to get that, get that done. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, well we appreciate it. I think Rebecca is going to be back online here in just a minute and we'll, okay. uh, 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 close but we we appreciate you and uh i'll see you here if rebecca comes back in so sounds great thanks so much for having me take care hey everybody i'm back <laughs> that was crazy wasn't it <laughs> where, where have you been <laughs> i just decided that you had it and i'll just go to the mall and maybe do some shopping <laughs> yeah that's what i Something figured like <laughs> No, my internet was insane and it just kept going in and out and in and out. And it was such a distraction and Dave was such an awesome guest and it was such an important topic that I didn't want that distraction back and forth. So I just thought, you know what, Landon, take it away. And you did. And I thought it was really good because you're both return missionaries. You both can talk about that and, and kind of relate, you know, I never did serve a mission. Yeah, it was, it, he really had a difficult situation there. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, you know, and it's funny to think like we kept talking about before I glitched out uh, into another stratosphere, wherever I was. Um, it really was only 20 years ago. Yet the way he describes it, it seems so archaic, you know, but yeah. it really was only 20 years ago. And it's like the world moves on this way as far as care of people in trauma you know, importance of contacting family, importance of dealing with things right away, right after. And like President Holland always says, the church is 20 years behind on this, much to the detriment 
of a lot of these kids who I think only now maybe are starting to process as adults, you know, full grown adults like Dave. So I don't know. It, it's well, really I, interesting to talk about. I don't think the church values uh, mental health uh, issues. They It's always, well, if you pray enough, if you yeah. seek the Holy Ghost, if you go to church, all those things will be solved. The gospel will solve all your problems. And that's mm -hmm. just not the reality. No, I think that's true. I think they're trying to do better. I mean, we personally have run into somebody that was a mental health senior missionary, right? Who actually mm -hmm. had a background in that field. But from my understanding, she was covering like several missions, like one or two people for a vast area and a vast number of kids. And I swear now that they're going out younger at 18, um, there's a difference just in being able to cope. I mean, I know 18 year old, 19, 20, don't like to think of themselves as little kids, but when you get to be my age, yeah, that, <laughs> no, they really a, are. That's a good point. The kids are a year, year younger than a they were younger. before. And that's a big mm -hmm. deal when you're, mm -hmm. you know, 18 to 19 uh, yep. and they haven't been out of school at all. They're going that's straight it. from high school. Yep. So that's definitely a good point. No, it is. They've never lived on their own. I mean, if they go like some of my kids right out of high school from mm -hmm. my home to the mission field, They've never had what say you had that year in between, or maybe you got some school in, maybe you lived in a dorm, maybe you lived at home, but you were still maybe working a, a job, you know, you were, you were adulting kind of, yeah. and then you step into the mission. This is, I mean, pressure cooker, 18 year old from high school, senior year, which is usually oh, whatever, you know, to this incredible pressure cooker. I also feel there's the sense that in getting ready for a mission, you are a hero, you know, yeah. I mean, there's so much activity around you and excitement, getting the clothes and the parties and the girlfriends and the, you are just this conquering hero. And then you're in the MTC. Look at you within a few days. I'm so guilty. You know, it's, I would feel like there'd be this kind of weird letdown, like, oh, now this is what I really have to do. Well, then you get on the mission and it's just like solid stop. You know, it, yeah, that's what it, I mean. This you, you went from hero to zero, literally yeah. in the three weeks you were in MT, yeah. in the MTC. So yep. I can definitely see it uh, have an effect, yeah. and I did see it have an effect on my mission. Yeah, no, I think so too. I mean, I do know from other relatives that have gone on missions, and these were sister missionaries. You know, when there was any sense of perhaps some mental health issues or stress. They, they do have mission counselors. I guess I shouldn't say that they don't have support. The one person we talked to is a mental health kind of over everything, but they do have counselors that you can go to. They can put you on medication. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know how I feel about that, especially without the parents' direct involvement. I mean, sure, they're adults, but are you adult enough to say, yeah, sounds good. Put me on this, this drug. This sounds yeah. good. And, and I've seen more you know? people go on medication on their mission uh, than I've ever seen him anywhere else in life. Uh, I know. So, uh, it, yeah, that tells you something. This experience yeah. that's supposed to make you happy and mm -hmm. and bring joy to your life is it? Is it doing that? Because that's not what I'm seeing. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of medicated uh, people yeah. coming back, or not yeah. medicated and very depressed people coming back. I know. Um, in, I know. It, I, large numbers. Yeah. I know the church is trying. I mean, I know that they've done, and you and Dave, I think talked about it. They've done, you know, the surveys, the safety surveys, things like that. They had that little series of videos, how to stay safe, but it still seems really sugar-coated to me. Just stay on the lighted path. Don't go in a dark alley. Yeah, that's great. And then, you know, that that's not the reality sometimes of what these missionaries are facing. No one's putting themselves in harm ways. There's a sense that if you follow the rules of the mission, you're going to be completely safe. I mean, maybe safer, but there are so many anomalies, so many things that can happen, like what happened to Dave. So I don't know. And just the idea of, of knowing that my, something like that happened to my child, you know, if it did, and I didn't find out till, mm. till years later, or I just, you know, you got to be with your family to process things like that. That's part of the healing process. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely something that you need the support of a family or, or close friends to, to make through. And you're, you're there with some someone you've never met before, but other than maybe a week before he was assigned to you. So I know, yeah. you know, it's, it's funny. I really had that sense when my second son went on a mission. And I think I've talked about this a little, I don't talk very much about them out of respect and privacy, but you know, he and I were like little buddies doing all kinds of prom stuff together, homecoming signs, you know, all the stuff you do when your kid's going through high school. And I just had this sense, 
you know, when you left on the mission, that's it. You know, that era is over. The mission is almost for that to kind of change that relationship, you know, forever. And yeah. I compare that to friends and relatives I have where their kids did not go on a mission. Their relationship continues. They're mm -hmm. with them there their freshman year. They're hanging out. They're barbecuing. They're at dinner. They don't lose this two years where you're just interacting on a video or, or on a phone every once in a while. In my case, it was before phone calls. You know, it's it's a severing. I just, I really sense that, that it's a severing that now you're you're an adult now and you need to go do this and you're a missionary and a priesthood holder and you go out there, you know? It's just different. It changes the relationship forever. Well, and the people who make up these rules, the people who uh, set up the missions and make all of the requirements and the, how often you can call home, they're all church employees. This is their yeah. life. This is what they love. Yeah. This is the thing they've dedicated their life to. 18 year old kid, he hasn't. This isn't the, you know, he gets out there and church isn't the most important thing to him, but he's got to live it for two years. And if that's not your thing and selling the gospel isn't your thing, it can be a very dark place to be. And, uh, yeah. you know, I've, I've seen that. I was, in that place, I was not a natural salesman. That's not what I enjoyed doing. Uh, I wasn't afraid to talk to people, but talking to them about religion was not my my thing. And now all I do is talk to people about religion. So, <laughs> see, you've evolved. You've morphed. I've evolved. <laughs> You're an anti missionary. I don't know what you are. So that's right. No, I know. And then I know there are people who just love their missions. Just love them. You know, mm -hmm. it really is just based on you know. But the, the child and their personality, but the mission is not really cut out for that. It's a cookie cutter where certain people are going to thrive and do really well. Other people are going to have a really hard time. And I don't know if there's understanding of those people. It is not for everyone. I know the service mission is now a good option, you know, that you can choose different things, you know, but. And I would have enjoyed that. I, I, yeah. To me, I was a more of a hands-on doing. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to do, I want to see a difference. Um, you know, missionary work is really a, a sales job. You're selling the gospel and I'm not a salesman. That's not yep. what I enjoy. Yep. Uh, no, and and we... pe yeah. People who are salesmen thrive in that environment. Yeah. People who are not uh, usually get yep. very depressed because they they don't like meeting goals of baptisms. Yeah. And Glenn, Glenn Gary, away. Glenn Ross, right? The board here, the stats, ring that yep. bell. Some people love that. And they usually yep. go into careers that involve that. Other people, it's just painful and devastating yeah. and they can't function. I just think how we always talk about why can't there be true service missions where for two years, you're going to go build a school in Zimbabwe. I mean, it literally yeah, Peace is Corps an mission uh, project. I, I would have enjoyed the Peace Corps more. I would have felt like I was yeah. doing something yep. to change the world. Uh, yep. I, I didn't feel that way on my mission. I felt like nobody wanted what I was there for. And I was just wasting my time. If I was doing something that would have helped some people, I would have much more enjoyed that. I'm sure you moved some furniture. Did you move some furniture? I did move furniture, yes. I knew you did. Yeah, that's what my sons say. All we do is move furniture. That's yeah. it. That's all we do. <laughs> well, of course, they they put an ad on Facebook that said, we'll move furniture. Well, yeah. It, that... a message. So <laughs> who's not going to take advantage of that, right? We did the old-fashioned way where the elder scorn called <laughs> oh, there you go so yeah i don't know just that idea of actual service actual hands-on working you know that's so good for accomplishment feelings of accomplishment and self-esteem and i don't know why the church doesn't figure this out but that is a way to reach people because you're out there you're really performing service you have the chance just organically to talk to people and that's way more natural than knocking on a door and having people go nope you know yeah. Absolutely. Like a walking stereotype and your mental health is suffering. So, so I'm really glad that Dave uh, reached out to us and shared his story. I think that was, that was really brave to do, you know, because like he said, there's this sense, did I do something wrong? I should snap out of this. I should feel great right away, you know, but he's really honest and vulnerable about all of it. And I'm so glad he has such family support. It sounds like he's in an amazing situation where he has tons of support and can work through these things. And I know he's not the only one. I know by a long shot, he's not the only one. I mean, not everybody had an experience like his, maybe where it was a gun to yeah. your head and your life. But there are moments, I think that every missionary would say, I was really afraid or I was really stressed out. And your body and your brain are going to react to that. So and you can't just say, I was fine. It was then. 
yeah, you can't get over that. No, I agree hundred percent. So, yep. Anyway, it was a good one. I'm glad I was able to come back at the end. So I, I was too, like, going you're the one job. who finishes us up every week. So <laughs> you mean, you can't say thanks everybody and push the notification. You, you don't have that on speed. I don't dial have that memorized. <laughs> you're going to have to practice that because who knows what's going to happen with my internet, but no, uh, I, was, I, I just say, and I'm landing. That's all and I, I know. That's it. And I take it from there. There you go. We always say woman led podcast, right? That's, that's right. And so, woman ended podcast. So. Woman ended podcast. That's right. So no, I'm glad that you guys had a chance to kind of talk missionary to missionary. I think that's really good. And, and I think it was a really important topic. And I think when the movie heretic yes heretic yeah, yeah. comes out i think this topic will kind of come up to the surface again i think a lot of people are going to talk about how realistic is this you know how you know because in this case in the movie they the women thought they were following the rules mm. they went to the door he they said he said come in and they said well we can't unless your wife's home and he said my wife is home can't you smell that blueberry pie baking and they're like oh okay if she's in the kitchen come sit down and they did. And there's that moment in the trailer where one of the sister missionary looks over and there's a blueberry pie scented candle. And at that moment, they know that they're in trouble and they're something's trouble. going on. Yeah. So who it gives me goosebumps just to think about. But I know this topic is going to come up, you know, harm's way, danger, even though I feel, feel like this will be more of a psychological thriller, you know, and make everybody kind of dig deep and think. But yeah, maybe we'll have to have a Mormonish party. And all go together. Whoever's in the area, friends, viewers, wouldn't that be fun? Let's do a Mormonish view party. Mormonish view party with of Hugh the Grant. heretic. Yeah. That's right. Heretic Hugh Grant. Everybody put it on your calendar. We'll figure it out. All right. Well, please uh, comment and let us know what you thought of this episode. I thought Dave was just wonderful. Have any of you had experiences that you're still kind of processing from your mission? I'm guessing a lot of you had, and I hope that you... I hope that um, watching this wasn't traumatic. I hope that it. I hope that it helped in some way. That's why we had Dave on just to kind of process and bring some issues to the forefront. So please leave us your comments. Let us know about your experiences. Please like and subscribe to Mormonish Podcast. And if you'd like to be made aware when new episodes come out, you can hit the notification bell. If you would like to help financially support the Mormonish Podcast, we have links in the show notes to. Um, donor box. We are a 5013C. And I will make this little note. We are, our 5013C is called Bibliotech Media. Some people have asked us, oh, I've tried to search you guys under Mormonish. We're not Mormonish. We're kind of an umbrella called Bibliotech Media. So uh, donor box is a really easy way to set up monthly payments or make a one-time donation. And we absolutely appreciate so much everybody that does that you really allow us to keep podcasting and to bring you the stories that i think are really interesting and helpful to everybody so um also our merch store right we've got right. merch that's on there too so yeah so many opportunities to spend a lot of time in the show notes right does anyone go to show notes i thought they do i do when i go on other people's podcasts i do so I don't you know. spend a lot of time there I do spend a lot of time online. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. And again, I'm sorry, everybody, about my internet problems. We will try to get this in hand before we have our next podcast. So thank you. We'll see you next time on Mormonish. Thanks. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.